All right, screens up, I trust. Thank you, Tyler. All right, so I was uh, scaring you guys. Last time I talked to you, it was 80 slides or something like that. Uh, I was going through my files this morning and I noticed that I had revised this and trimmed her down to just over 30 slides. So this is a lot less painful than I thought it was going to be. So let's have a look at protocols part B. Uh, the idea here is to kind of introduce us into uh, field bus communication devices and field bus uh, protocols and, and networking and how, how they kind of work. So moving into the full digital uh, control system. Okay, so why do we need to know this? In order to install and commission communication systems, you will need to know some knowledge of protocols and how they work. So first off, we're going to be describing communication devices and application software, although I don't remember reading anything about software in the ILM. Um, so we're going to be looking at three different types of protocols. First is HART which as we remember from uh, third year and earlier this year, we can have up to 15 devices in a uh, multi-drop type uh, field bus. Then we'll talk about a uh, foundation field bus, which can have up to 255 devices on a, on a field bus network. And for some reason, I didn't put a number beside device net, but uh, we'll talk about device net uh, third. Uh, when we get into discussing them, we'll be looking at uh, similar characteristics between the three of them and then of course uh, the differences between the three of them so things like 15 devices uh, 250 devices I think this was uh, 63 if I remember correctly uh, things like that so the things that we're looking at will be common uh, between the protocols but the values uh, and specifications will be different for each of them Okay, all of this protocol stuff is built off of what's called the uh, OSI model, the Open, what's this, Open Standards Interconnect model. And basically it's a map that is used by vendors so that they can design equipment that can be used uh, across technology in, inside of a network. So it can use devices from different manufacturers, different vendors uh, in the same system. And this is kind of a map for those manufacturers so that they can make their systems communicate inside that particular network uh, with the other devices. So the OC layer uh, has seven layers, as you can see here. Uh, there's a lot of detail involved in the OC uh, layer model uh, that we don't necessarily have to get too in-depth with. Um, but do know that there's seven layers. And as we go through these protocols, you'll see that uh, some of them will use more of these uh, layers than others. Uh, none of the ones that we discuss use all seven. Um, so as we go through the lecture here, pay attention to the protocol and uh, the number of and which layers of this OC model that they use for, uh, for their design. Okay, so it has seven layers. We focus basically on the bottom three or four, and that's not exclusive. Uh, most of them will use the bottom two for sure, and then uh, one or two from somewhere else in that uh, in that model. Um, we have to know what each level is for, um, so that different manufacturers, of course, can make compatible products, as I was saying earlier. Okay, so starting out at the bottom, uh, that OSI model is the physical layer, and what happens in the physical layer is it provides the definitions for the electrical signaling method that's going to be used. Uh, so voltage levels or, or signal signal type. Uh, then it also defines the network topology, which is, uh, you know, whether it's a, a multi, multi drop bus uh, or point to point or things of that nature. And it also covers things like cabling. So kind of the, I don't know if you can say it's measurable um, but these are the things that we address uh, in the in the physical layer in the physical layer this is the standards that the manufacturers use to ensure compatibility okay for example in heart 
which is an open field bus protocol managed by Hart, of course. Um, it tells us that we use uh, frequency shift keying and we use our uh, varied frequency or frequency shift, of course, to 1,200 and 2,200 hertz. And it also tells us that when we're uh, doing digital only signaling, we have to have an address between 1 and 15. And when we want to use uh, analog and digital or the, or the pure analog or the hybrid uh, style uh, that we can use with heart, um, the address has to be, has to be zero. Um, so between these two images that you see here, this is representing a digital only signaling, which means that the 4 milliamp value never actually changes. This is the amount of draw that the transmitter uh, uses as it's uh, operating. And the data is contained uh, within the little packets of information that you, that you see here. Um, in the analog version or the hybrid version, um, the milliamp voltage uh, changes. And then these packets are used basically just for diagnostics and a measurement value is this analog milliamp uh, value here. So uh, all kinds of good stuff on this slide. So digital only requires four milliamps uh, basically to keep it running. Um, addressing one to five for digital, or sorry, one to 15 when digital and address is zero when in analog. Uh, when in digital, you can have full du duplex communication. We discussed this earlier. And we call the uh, network access method that Hart uses uh, master slave, uh, meaning that the master commands information, says, hey, I want to know something. And the slave responds back with that information. And that's what's represented here in the graph. So this could be, hey, tell me what your process variable is right now. And the response will be, yeah, my process variable is uh, 100 PSIs. Uh, so inside this data package here, there will be uh, the number 100. There will be a bit in there that tells you it's uh, PSIs or percentages or whatever it happens to be. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, do you still have the page number associated with this slide? Um, I went to the IOM. Page five. OK, thanks. Page five. page five. Yeah, sorry I don't have page numbers on here. OK, so more specs uh, related to heart. Uh, 1,200 baud, so this is the speed at which it transmits information. And we discussed that, that earlier. Baud is related to the size of the word, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the data package for Heart contains eight data bits, uh, odd parity, and one stop bit. And we'll discuss that uh, in a in a later lecture, um, but we've talked about it, and it'll it'll uh, go into a little bit more on that in the ILM. Uh, but these are the kinds of things that we're looking at as we go between the different protocols. So you'll see that the, the data that's transmitted and the, the way they package that data changes. Uh, throughout the different protocols. So field bus will be a little bit different. Device net will be a little bit different. Uh, and again, generally advancing uh, technologically. Uh, technologically. So HART, uh, again, this is mostly review, can coexist with 4 to 20 analog signaling, uh, making an easy upgrade versus other bus types. Uh, again, related to cabling because HART uses uh, shielded twisted pair type cabling, which is very simple and very standard. Uh, we can take a, an analog device that's on that type of wire, drop in a heart uh, compatible device, and still be able to use that same cabling. And that's one of the big uh, pluses uh, that are associated with heart and why heart uh, has become quite popular. OK, network topology for heart uh, can be either point to point. And this is what we most often see in industry still today, where we have a field device coming into uh, an I, basically an I.O. point or a channel in our PLC system. One device, one channel. Or, of course, where we're leading up to here and the whole point of fourth year is digital communications and field buses. And this is what the heart multi-drop bus would look like. And again, it has a, a major bus. And then we have the drops that come off of uh, the bus itself. And for heart, we can run up to about 15 devices 
And you remember in third year, we said, yeah, you can run 15 devices, but typically you're limited by the size of this power supply. Uh, most industry standard power supplies, uh, you know, are, are, are set to the point where they can only handle, you know, three or four at a time. So uh, in a dedicated field bus part network, you know, you'd have to have a bigger power supply in order to, to run all 15 of the devices. Okay, cabling for heart. Uh, no specific cable specification uh, or impedance is required. Uh, no end of line resistor is required. And we'll talk a little bit more about end of line resistors uh, later on. I think we mentioned it earlier uh, when we were talking about cabling. Uh, I'll get to you in a second here, Michael, when we were talking about cabling and reflected signals uh, and the termination uh, resistor or the end of line resistor was there to prevent signals from hitting the end of the line, reflecting back down the line, colliding uh, with the next signal, and then creating a, a jumbled signal that is not of the quality that we require. Go ahead, Michael. I just noticed that the uh, hot uh, loop resistance is 230 ohms, and the maximum is uh, 1100, comparing to the mud bus. How do they calculate the loop resistance um, for this communication protocol? It's based on what? It is, uh, it's based on wire length and demand from the devices. So most devices operate on TTL logic, which is digital logic, which operates on a one to five volt scale. So in order to convert that one to five volts into four to 20 milliamps, uh, if you did the, if you did the uh, Ohm's triangle, the EIR triangle, if you remember the EIR triangle um, with voltage on the E on the top, voltage on the top, and then current and resistance. If you did that one to five volts with a 250 ohm resistor worked into there, you would see that that 250 ohms uh, magically converts one to five volts into four to 20 milliamps. Um, so they need at least that 230 uh, ohms in order to get that one to five volts converted into a four to 20 milliamp signal. How do they measure it? Uh, it's, it's comprised of the end device along with, along with all the cabling that's involved. And you may have noticed in some cases in the lab, maybe last year when you tried to hook up a heart device and you couldn't communicate with it and we had to throw a, a resistor into the, into the loop. The reason we had to do that is because most of the time uh, the cable is long enough, it has enough ohms per foot that you'll get 250 ohms just out of the cabling. Um, but in the lab, our cable runs are very short, so we don't get that amount of resistance. That's why we have to add the resistor in there. So th thanks for bringing that up. Uh, yeah, heart is 230 to 1100 is technically the spec, um, but 250 is what we use because it works out very well for the math. So uh, tell us what's the spec for the communication wire. Does this require shielded, twisted pair, or they have different standards? So for, for heart, there is no specific cable specification or impedance. Industry standard is shielded, twisted pair in the field. And you can use uh, unshielded, twisted pair in controlled environments, you know, like the control room where you don't have a lot of uh, EMF. And, and, and it's a good question because uh, we start out with heart, which really has no specific specifications. The next protocols that we start to talk about do um, have specific specifications. And it has to do with the increase in technology when we're going, if we're talking about heart specifically in digital, and we should be considering this in digital, keep your brains in digital at this point. Um, the more capabilities you get with digital communication, the more data that has to be transferred. Thereby, there's a requirement for ensuring that that data is, uh, hasn't been compromised or the signal is, is adequate. So the specifications for the wires uh, increases as that demand for data also increases. So HART being the simplest protocol doesn't really have uh, any specific cable specifications. And you'll see there's no impedance value, uh, no terminating resistor uh, required. I hope that answers your question for you. 
Okay, um, this little table here, um, I'm just in relating the number of devices that you can throw on a multi-drop network related to the length, uh, the length of the cable. Uh, none of this data is particularly, particularly important to us. Um, what I do want you to recognize here is as we increase the number of devices on a, on a trunk, um, the length of the trunk is gonna have to get shorter. Okay, that's really all this graph represents for us. Okay, second layer in the OSI model that applies to heart uh, is the data link layer. And if I scoot all the way back here, so physical layer, data link layer, you can see data link layer here is used to establish the data packet structure, the framing, uh, type of error detection, and a couple of, uh, couple of other things here. So framing is kind of like how do we, how do we assemble our, our data? It's like, the, it's like the format for writing a letter tells us how to put all your data together. Uh, so let's look at that here. Okay, so within the data link layer here, we define the network access method, and we'll talk about different network access methods. Uh, master slave is a common one that you might have heard. Polling is another one. Burst is another one. So we'll talk about that. Uh, they'll change as we go between these protocols. Message frame structure, again, the size, uh, the size of the frame, how many data bits, how many uh, error bits, uh, how many uh, stop bits, start bits, that kind of thing. So how is the data packaged? Uh, error detection and device addressing all contained all contain within the data link layer. So this is all um, internal stuff. Okay, so speaking specifically now to heart network access, heart is typically a master slave or sometimes called a pull response. Uh, system again, master slave. The the master says, "Hey, I want to know what your PV is." You, as a transmitter, respond back to me. If I don't ask you, you don't respond. So it's good that way. Um, another way that heart can be used is called burst mode, uh, and burst mode is basically the master calling out to all of the slaves, saying, "Please send me your latest information," and all the slaves will in turn send their information back to the master. Okay, frame structure for heart, eight fields in a heart message frame, okay? Keep track of these numbers because they change as we uh, go through the protocols. So the eight fields here, preamble, SD, AD, CD, BC, status, data, parity, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is what a message frame looks like. Uh, Details of each frame, again, a little bit next level for us. Um, the object of this ILM here is to be able to uh, distinguish between the different types of protocols and how they compare to each other in terms of uh, the physical layer, the data layer, how they use the OC model, uh, that type of thing. So drilling down this far, a little bit farther than we need to go. Um, so eight frames, the ILM, has about four or five pages uh, dedicated to discussing each of these different frames. Um, that's really not our focus. Okay, third, third layer that Hart uses is the application layer. The application layer defines the format for the data in the message frame. So this uh, includes command codes, uh, numeric data, status bits, um, lots of stuff in the ILM about this. Uh, very, very specific to the heart devices and very in-depth, uh, far more in-depth than, than we need to worry about. And let me just have a quick look here uh, in the ILM. So application layer, one, two, three, four, five, six, six pages in the ILM that talks about um, the data that's used in these message frames, talks about the different command codes. Um, some of the command codes I might ask you about the very basic ones. Um, for example, if you're following along page 33, for example, shows uh, command code 33 uh, when sent to the transmitter says read specific uh, transmitter variables. So that tells the transmitter to read those, those variables of data. So again, drilling down pretty deeply in the ILM um, but the commands in general, these command codes, 
uh, can either be universal, so things like tell me what your process variable is, uh, common practice, uh, what examples do they give for common practice, uh, advanced configuration activities are, are inside this common practice commands, and then device specific commands um, specific to heart themselves. So I would don't I don't expect you guys to uh, know any of this stuff here. I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, just just know uh, that these are contained in the application layer. This is the type of stuff that you're going to find in the application layer. Okay, that zooms us along quite pages because I'm not going into all the details uh, of the command codes for heart from the ILM. So that skips us along uh, basically up to page 17 here where we start talking about the field bus protocol and where we start comparing uh, the two protocols uh, together. And then we'll, of course, get to device net, which we'll compare uh, yet once again. Okay, so field bus is the first all digital protocol that we look at. So heart, of course, was either analog, a combination of analog or digital or fully digital, depending on how we configured it. Field bus is just digital. That's all there is to it. Heart could have up to 15 devices. Field bus can have up to 255 devices on their network. Uh, we learned yesterday uh, that it has two distinct networks, the, the high speed ethernet network, which was the controller level network. So from the controller to the uh, operator stations and administration stations, and also the H1 network, which was the field bus network out in the field. Uh, data in the field network travels at 31.25 kilobytes per second, which is much faster than the uh, 1200 baud that we had in heart. So significantly faster. We went from uh, a couple thousand, and I'm just generally rounding that number. It's not anywhere accurate, but a couple thousand uh, bits per second for heart to 31,000 bits per second for field bus uh, protocol. So a significant improvement in data transfer speeds. Foundation uses four layers of the OC model, whereas Hart used three. So the four layers, physical, data, application, these were the same that Hart used, uh, but Foundation has, has the additional user layer of the OC model. So these are more along the lines of kind of things that we're, we're looking at for your understanding here is the, the distinction between the protocols. Okay, physical layer, again, nothing different here when we're talking physical layer, data layer, application layer, we're gonna be talking about the exact same things, protocol to protocol, um, just they're different in terms of uh, advancement technologically wise. Okay, so electrical signaling method for uh, foundation is full digital, of course. Uh, the signaling method with the type of signal is called Manchester biphase L encoding. Uh, and there's a little little blurb in the ILM, again, that talks about what, what Manchester biphase uh, encoding is. Um, not too important uh, that you become a master of it, but do understand uh, exactly what it is. Let me just quickly show on it here. So uh, it talks about uh, how it how it recognizes the the transitions from uh, zeros to ones and ones to zeros when we get a digital output, which is a, a pulsed a pulsed wave, um, and it, the different types of uh, encoding generally have to deal with: uh, Do I detect a transition from a low value to an upper value? or do I detect it as it's coming from a high value down to a low value, that type of thing. Um, but again, that would be another, another course. Okay, um, physical layer, uh, electrical signaling is based off the IEC 61158-2 standard. Network topology, uh, multi-bus, uh, multi-drop bus with the trunk line and spur lines. Uh, it's basically the same as uh, heart field bus, right? We have a main trunk with drops. Um, field bus is particular in that they, they actually call it a trunk line for the main line and spur lines for the individual drops that come off to the end devices. Cabling, 
Uh, some specification here, again, data transfer rates are going up, so specifications also go up. Um, for foundations, still using two wires, uh, but they are requiring now uh, 100 ohm uh, 100 ohm resistance or 100 ohm impedance. And we'll look at that a little bit deeper here uh, in the next couple slides. Okay, cabling, minimum of two conductors, 100 ohm repeatance, and a termination resistor is required. Okay, and we'll talk more about termination resistors moving ahead here. Uh, it goes on to mention that there's four different types of cables that are specified for a foundation field bus from shielded twisted pairs, uh, single pairs to multi pairs, and then unshielded twisted pair without the shield, uh, and then multiple wire pairs with shield and twisting. So uh, again, lots of options here, but most typically you end up with type A or type B. Don't get into the, we're not too worried about the details uh, here in terms of the different types. Um, again, the impedance is important. You see it doesn't change between the different types. Okay, so I kind of threw a bunch of, this is one of those uh, pictures are worth a thousand words uh, type of slides. So some of the unique characteristics uh, involved with a, a field bus, uh, field bus branded field bus. Um, Power supply, we've seen that before. Uh, we've seen a trunk, right? We've seen a trunk cable, the main trunk cable. Here we have the spurs, okay? Spur lines are the drops that go. Here we have the end of line resistors or the terminating resistors. I tend to call them end of line resistors, but terminating resistors. The value of these terminators is the same value as the impedance rating on the cable spec. So 100 ohm impedance cable is gonna require 100 ohm terminator resistor. Uh, intrinsically safe barriers, uh, optional, but usually included, uh, not just in foundation, but in other, uh, other protocols as well. What is unique here? Uh, power conditioner. So here we have a power conditioner between our power supply and our main trunk. Uh, this is uh, an addition uh, to foundation that we didn't have uh, in heart. And then there's, of course, uh, different types of hardware. When we get to the lab, uh, ask me and I will show you on our feet three-phase separator these different pieces of hardware um, that are used to make all these connections so uh, it looks like you got a piece of wire here and you just you know put a couple of squishy clam cell connectors on them and you're and you splice in like you do your trailer lights well it's not quite that primitive so trunk connections will uh, come into a block similar to this and then our spur lines will come off the other side so that's how this is actually is actually done it doesn't really look like this okay uh foundation field bus linking device we talked touched on this yesterday this is the device that's used to connect the um the h1 network or the field network to uh we don't show it here to the uh, operations or controller level network Oh, there's a slide for that. So there it is there. Field bus foundation device here. Connects to the field bus and provides us access from our workstations to the controller. Okay, third layer uh, of the OC model that foundation field bus utilizes. Uh, again, for review, and I review this with each protocol, just like kind of hammered into your brain what's covered in these different layers. Uh, so data link layer, again, network access method, frame structure, error detection, addressing, and types. Okay, so device types for foundation field bus, two types, uh, link masters, uh, and I don't elaborate on them very much. Uh, where did that go? Let me just pull this up here. There we go. Uh, link masters. Um, where am I going here? Link masters are, uh, I guess it's a hardware device. Is it a hardware device? 
At any rate, link masters are used to schedule communication between the control system and the bus devices themselves. And then they have just regular basic field devices. So different type, two different device types that we have. Okay, network access method for foundation field bus. Master slave, same as heart, pull response, same as heart. Or we see a new one here called token passing. Uh, token passing, call it uh, hot potato, if you like. This is where uh, if you have the potato, we get to talk. Or if you have the token, we get to talk. So the master will uh, send out this token. Uh, the slave will have the token, and the slave that has it gets to send information. Uh, then it gives the token back to the master. The master passes it off to the next slave, uh, so on and so forth. So a little, a little twist. Um, over, over heart. Okay, so it can do uh, either one or both as it does a scan cycle, depending on how you configure it. Okay, message frame, uh, message frame structure, <laughs> from the that frame structure, uh, it is coin fusing. Uh, forget about it. So I'm not sure. What, what I'm trying to get at there, um, but it uses the four layers. So physical layer, data link layer, uh, application layer, and this was, uh, these were combined actually in the, um, Jesus, where did that layer go? Do, 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 do. The data link layer, is that the one I'm thinking of here? Having a little bit of a brain fart. Perfect. Well, at any rate, so it uses the four layers. Oh, user layer. That's the one. This guy right here is the user layer. So you'll see as you go through the ILM, they get a little bit carried away, breaking out all this kind of stuff. And if you were going to become, uh, you know, a network analyst or something like that, this would be important to you. Um, but as a technician, it's not really important. Okay, user layer. What is the user layer used for? It's the first time we've talked about the user layer. So uh, things that go on inside the, inside the user layer. Uh, this is where the provisions are made for commissioning and configuring. Uh, the reading and writing of process data is handled in there. And advanced logic configuration is handled inside the user layer. And why this is significant and why they're using the user layer um, is because if you remember when we talked about Field Bus the other day, uh, and not Field Bus the brand, uh, Foundation Field Bus, we said that it was capable of performing PID uh, within the devices themselves. This is the provision in the user layer that allows that to occur. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about this advanced logic configuration. Okay, so many pages. Let me just get into my ILM here. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Next seven pages, I'll talk about commissioning and configuration uh, of these fancy dancy field bless uh, blocks uh, inside the uh, foundation field bus hardware or end devices that we can use and how, and how we can configure them. I am not going to uh, go into all of them. This is how I reduced my PowerPoint from 80 slides down to down to 30 um, by not talking about all the dirty details in there. Um, but what you need to know is that at a minimum, when you're dealing with foundation field bus, you must configure these two blocks: the resource block, which contains all the hardware info, uh, subparameters such as uh, target, actual, and, and permitted values that we're measuring and reading and writing. And then also the transducer block. And the transducer block is uh, its a transducer. It's the one that con uh, converts our signal. So these two blocks uh, have to be configured. And there's about seven pages in the ILM that walk you all through it. I do encourage you to, uh, I do encourage you to read it because it is not dissimilar than doing uh, function block programming in uh, PLC. Okay, uh, advanced logic associated with foundation, of course. 
Uh, we're still talking about how it allows that distributed field-based control um, where we can do uh, PID measurements in our analog devices here, our pressure transmitter in this case, and our uh, pressure controller or, or our valve here. We can do this outside of the PLC system, right? So no need for a PLC. I don't know of any applications that use it, but it's capable of it. Last protocol, DeviceNet. DeviceNet is the first protocol to use CIP. And CIP stands for, I believe, Common Industrial Protocol. I don't want to get that wrong. Common Industrial Protocol, correct uses five layers of the OC model. So nice that the ILM is laid out this way. We went from three for heart, four for foundation, and now five for device net. Device net can operate at three different speeds. Uh, details are in the ILM. Uh, you can use three different speeds, but you cannot mix and match the three different speeds. So pay attention to that as you're reading uh, as you're reading through there. Um, and if we reflect back on the other two protocols, 1200 baud, uh, 31.25 kilobytes, uh, and now we're at 125, 250, and 500. So again, at a minimum, this is four times faster than the previous protocol. So we're developing as we move along here. Uh, again, similar to uh, chart to what we've seen um, before, uh, again, I'm not really too interested in drilling you on the on the specification itself, but do pay attention to the relationship between the amount of data that can be transported at a certain speed and the length of the cable. And as you see uh, throughout any of these graphs or charts that uh, we put up here, the faster your data transfer rate is, the shorter your cable. Uh, capabilities generally are. Okay, physical layer, uh, talking about device net here. Uh, again, full digital uh, and uses something called the CAN network. Uh, the CAN network was one of the very early uh, industrial networks. It was, it was devised back in the early uh, automotive uh, manufacturing days. Uh, when they started doing, um, you know, automated uh, production lines in, in automobile facilities, that's kind of where it came from. Uh, does it say anything about that in here? Let me just have a quick look here. Uh, no, it doesn't really. So it uses the CAN network. Uh, topology again, same as the other ones, basically multi-drop bus with a trunk line and a spur line. Uh, cabling specifications, special cabling wire, 120 ohms. So foundation was 100, heart had nothing. Uh, device net, 120 ohms. Cabling is a little bit more unique here for device net as we're about to find out. For conductors, as we see here, for conductors, two wires for power, two wires for data, and different classes, so class one and class two. And the major differences between class one and class two is the amount of load that they can carry. So class one can carry up to uh, nine amps and 600 volts. Class two, four amps, 300 volts. The ILM will talk about different types of cables uh, aside from the, the number of wires. Uh, they'll talk about, uh, let me just flip here. Where is that here? Thick round cables. Uh, thin round cables and flat cables. So round cable, uh, bad representation. Do I have another slide? No. Uh, bad representation of a flat cable, but let's call this our flat cable here. Um, differentiating between the two cables, this is standard industrial type cabling, uh, shielded, you know, all twisted, all that kind of stuff. Flat trunk cables are only for low noise environments, and they'll tell you specific applications where what they call low noise, but again, uh, control rooms, office areas, uh, some cabinets perhaps, um, but there's a distinction between the two types of cables that, that are made in the ILM. 
topology, a little bit more complicated when we're talking about device net here. So it's still, uh, still a main trunk line. We still have uh, drops or spurs. We have our terminating resistors on each end, um, just like we had in foundation field bus, except these ones are uh, 100, 120 ohms. Um, the difference between device net that we haven't looked at yet in the other protocols is that device net is a little bit particular in the amount of wire that you can use for these drops or these spur lines. Um, we used to have to do calculations on this, and I'm just quickly leaping through here. Uh, we don't have to do the calculations anymore, um, but there used to be uh, calculations involved here where we'd have to, you know, measure up all our different drop drop lengths and all that kind of stuff, and then we could relate it to a, a chart similar to you, similar to where you would see on page. Uh, oh, here actually, on on this page here. So you. You total it all up and you say, okay, I got so many meters. This is how I pick my data speed. Go ahead, Michael. For those uh, communication wire pooling and determination, is that belongs to electrician or is uh, instrumentation scope of work? Uh, depends on your site. Uh, if you're a union site, it will probably be electricians. If you're a non union site, it could be anybody. Whoever gets the work, whoever bids on the work, depends on the, there's too many variables there, right? Depends, depends, depends who gets the contract. If it's an electrical contractor gets the E&I contract, then they probably do it all. If it's union, it'll be electricians. If it's non-union, it could be anybody. So for the scope of the work, what do we do as the instrumentation then? The program and the configuration commissioning for this uh, uh, instrument? So from my experience, I spent the first, my first dozen or so years working in the union. So typically what would happen in a union environment is the, um, the, elect, the electricians would pull the cable. The, uh, it was the electrical union and the pipe fitters union. So the pipe fitters union would put in the end devices. So the transmitters and the valves, uh, the electricians would put in all the, hardware, they would pull the cable. And then when it came to commissioning, they would take one person from the pipe fitters union, one person from the electrical union, and they would commission together because the, the pipe fitter guy would do, you know, all the, would do all the simulating, pumping up the transmitter, all that kind of stuff. And the electrical guy would do all the connections. Um, in the non-union world, most of the time, they send out an instrument guy and he'll do all of it. Hope that answers your question. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. So anyway, uh, back in the day, uh, we used to drop a, a diagram like this on you guys and you'd have to calculate the length of all the spur runs and everything. And we'd use that to determine how much uh, or what the data speed is that we would have to use for that particular bus. Uh, and that relates to a chart here. So like for example, if I had a cumulative drop line length of 156 meters, I could only transmit data at this speed. If my drop length totaled uh, a lower value, surprise, surprise, you could have more data speed. Uh, again, a lower value or less meters, faster data rate. Um, but at a bare minimum here, the, the thing we're still holding on to here is the maximum spur or drop length is six meters. So you'll see here, none of them, none of these drops are, are longer than six meters. So uh, whenever you get to a situation where you're doing up this kind of math uh, and you're close, you gotta pick the, the slower, the slower speed, uh, more detail than we need. But that's the idea here is that uh, the length of these cables is related to the data speed that we can use. Oh, and for each of those drop lines that you have there, you just add add them all up. So like in the, uh, the first one there, the three meters plus three meters plus two meters plus one meter, one meter, like you just add all those up for each spur. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And then you'll add up, you'll add up this spur, this spur, 
these two spurs all together, however many meters this is, let's say it's, uh, you know, say it's uh, 120, let's say it's 100 meters. If it's 100 meters, you can only do 125 kilobytes. If it's 76 meters, you can use 250. Okay, and then it doesn't matter the length of the trunk line then? No, I don't believe it matters. So. Does it matter with the trunk line? Sure it does, yeah. On the page preceding, uh, it talks about the trunk line length as well. Okay. Okay, so it's everything all added up together. It's everything all added up. Yeah. Copy that. Yeah. Okay, uh, so that was physical layer, now we're a data link layer, so second layer again, nothing new here. Uh, Sorry, Tyler. Yep. Yeah. Uh, just to continue on the last question uh, for this one for those topology design who is going to do this work is that uh, electrical engineer or is in instrumentation engineer uh, I would I would imagine that this would be the instrument engineer okay yeah thanks it's a good question though because uh, again it depends who you, it depends who you work for because device net has power also inside the same cable so it could be both, it could be a team, but I would guess that I would say probably an instrument tech technologist or instrument engineer technologist. That would be my guess. Okay, so again, data link layer, same things that we've looked at with the other two protocols, what type of network access method. Uh, in this case, it's pulled. Uh, which we've talked about before, uh, and then cyc cyclic or strobe, which we haven't talked about, so we'll, hopefully there's a slide in there to talk about that. Uh, message frame structure, we'll look at how this uh, varies from the previous protocols, and uh, addressing in types. Uh, we really haven't defined any of that kind of stuff here, but uh, 63 devices for device net, so 15 for heart, 255 for foundation, and 63 for device net. Well, that's it. End of the <laughs> end of the road there. I guess I didn't feel like talking anymore. Yeah. Um, what is there? I'll just I'll just talk real quickly about pulled messaging here. Uh, so pulled messaging uh, scanner module initiate initiates communication directly with the single field device and then awaits a response. So it's not really any different than. Uh, Foundation field bus in in that regard. It says, "Hey, uh, give me give me a you uh, Ray. Give me your information." Ray responds back to me. Uh, strobed is uh, as you'll read in the ILM here a variant of pulled messaging. Um, instead of an individual uh, device, uh, the scanner will broadcast its command to all the devices in the segment, and then each device will respond in turn uh, with the data. That's what they call strobed. And then cyclic is is as it sounds, cyclic. It just goes through, it just goes through the uh, network device by device. Okay, uh, message frame structure. Do I have anything exciting to add to that? No, do they? Um, no. They don't even talk about it either. So I guess that's why I didn't talk about it. So that's uh, that's the end of this PowerPoint. And let me just, uh, I'm just going to get off. Uh, how do I get out of here? My mouse is not working. There we go.